Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Welcome back. It sounds like everyone had a uh, invigorating spring break. I hope you're relaxed, refreshed, ready to conquer the last few weeks of the semester. Um, your TFs have been working furiously over the break to finish all, all grading, particularly for all the people who uh, had to delay their papers for senior theses and whatnot, but we're, we're happy to have that, both your senior theses, the first paper and the grading behind us. Um, most of the TFs will send back, uh, if you had electronic copies, they'll send that back in the next 24 hours, likely this afternoon. Um, if you're with Adam and you have hard copies, um, he's going to pass those out in, in section. Uh, you can also get in touch with him uh, sooner if you desperately need to know, but those papers are in the process of being handed back. Um, you'll also notice that the second paper details have been posted. Uh, the due date for that is April 8th, and this is an opportunity for you to think about remedies, about how you uh, address and resolve some of the problems in the cases that we're looking at. Um, there's two announcements I want to note, uh, things that may be of interest to you. Um, the first is, two, these are two re things related to the Ethics Center. Um, one thing we're going to look at rather late in the course uh, is our, our questions about the development of knowledge and how that might be corrupted. We're going to think about universities, uh, how we discover and disseminate knowledge here. We're going to think about uh, think tanks, this sort of bridge between the academic and political world. But we're also going to think about journalism. The journalism is, is often a way that you get a uh, flashlight shown on controversies. It's a way of exposing problems, and journalism is for that reason, sort of vitally important to the way we think about democratic governance. So we're able to, um, you know, have journalists out there doing the investigative work to bring things to our attention. But that raises the question about what if journalism itself becomes corrupted by various sorts of influences and interests. And we're going we're to discuss that briefly near the end of the course. Um, but as a preview for that, if you're, if you're really interested in journalism, I encourage you to come to Andrew Sullivan's talk, which is this Thursday. Sullivan's going to be talking at 5.30 over the law school in Austin Hall, 100 North. Um, Sullivan has had a sort of a, a, an interesting journalistic career. He's a graduate of Harvard, uh, had a PhD here many years ago, I believe, in government, and went on to have a, a variety of journalistic ventures. Most recently, he has a, uh, a blog that he has a pay, that's behind a paywall, and he's going to be talking about the, um, how advertising, how the dependence on advertising and its revenues uh, has defeated journalism in his view. Uh, and he's known to be a, a particularly provocative and thoughtful commentator. It starts at 5.30. Um, the talk itself will probably go about 40, 45 minutes. And uh, then there'll be some Q&A afterwards. But you're absolutely welcome to come late, leave early, go back and forth. It's a large classroom and easy to sneak in the back. Um, so that's this Thursday. Uh, that's on the Ethics Center website. Let me also mention, um, if any of you are thinking about summer projects, and this could take a variety of forms, there are um, grants available from the Ethics Center for undergraduates explicitly. This could be something that you get really excited with your final project. You think, I think there's a great story here that I want to investigate in more detail, uh, and I want to apply for a project to do that. It may be that you have some other interest, totally unrelated to this class, but you think it has uh, you know, some essential relationship to questions of ethics in society. Uh, these grants go from $500 to $3,000, and they're, I believe, due the 4th of April. Um, so if, if that's something that interests you, you can check that as well. Uh, please, I encourage anyone who doesn't have a seat to, to there's plenty of seats uh, in the middle here. Don't worry about stepping over somebody. Uh, finally, the, the details of the final project haven't changed since we talked about them before break. We're still waiting for confirmation from the Lamont Media, Media Library uh, for one tutorial. We want to have them set up. Uh, but those details should be codified very, very soon, hopefully as soon as this afternoon. Um, the, the one thing I want to draw your attention to, though, is we, really, uh, we hope at this stage you're already thinking about that final project. Again, it's a video up to five minutes in length. Um, you have a lot of creative, creative uh, license on how you want to do that. Um, we're going to be providing a lot of resources, technical resources, uh, as well as a, a very detailed spelling out of what, we're, what we hope to see in that final project. Um, but right now, what we'd like you to have, at least by April 3rd, is a paragraph that can be shorter than the, um, the weekly blog post, just a paragraph that identifies the question you want to investigate, as well as one visual. One visual element, whether it be a picture, a clip, uh, a drawing, a sketch, <coughs> something that, that is going to give you something to, um, some initial thing to think about in terms of what you believe a visual um, media could accompany the kind of project you're doing. Uh, we think that's going to be extremely helpful for you in terms of planning the, the, the next four weeks of research out for that. 
Um, so that's all we have to say in housekeeping. Any questions so far on these uh, course details? Okay. Seeing none, let me uh, introduce, we have a new theme this week. Uh, the theme this week is health, medicine, and the pharmaceutical industry. You're going to recognize some familiar problems that we've uh, covered before. Uh, as, as you see in one of the readings that um, I had with Jennifer Miller, and Jennifer's going to be here on a Thursday to do a piece with Larry, a more detailed piece in the pharmaceutical industry at large. Um, some of the common themes that might promote problems of institutional corruption is first that you have enormous amounts of money at stake. I don't know if anyone remembers a figure about how much money is spent in health around the world each year. It's something around $3 trillion. Um, and in many countries, particularly developing countries, uh, medical expenditures are the second largest expenditures for any household uh, beyond food. So we're talking about this you know, massive amounts of money at stake. Um, you also have the case that this is a little complex because we often talk about what are the standards or purposes. And we can all agree that health is an important purpose for healthcare. Um, but you have a lot of differences in terms of expectations that, that are reasonable in different areas of the globe in developing economies, in first world hospitals. So there are these questions of sort of, uh, let's see, glo globalization and cultural uh, norms, that these are going to change a little bit. So you might have to calibrate um, you know, your expectations for institutions according to these things. Three, this is an area where there's massive regulatory interaction. Um, so in the United States, we have uh, the Food and Drug Administration overseeing all sorts of drug trials, uh, drug registries, uh, the rolling out and approval of pharmaceutical products. Uh, you also have massive um, oversight of doctor's licensing, uh, medical reimbursements, healthcare systems. Um, so everything we were worried about in terms of you know, regulatory capture and regulatory oversight are going to be magnified in this domain as well. Um, finally, th there's one area where I think medicine and health is most problematic, and that is the way in which it involves and necessitates expert judgment. So there's disagreements in politics, disagreements in economics, they can be complex, but it's in medicine where all of us are necessarily, unless we are doctors, relying on the advice of somebody who spent most of their life training in medical knowledge, reading scientific reports, practicing in clinical settings, and we basically have to outsource our judgment to these people. We need to trust them. And the corruption of expert judgment, both in clinical practice, that is the doctors we interact with, as well as in the scientific community, that is, are these scientific studies that are, you know, claiming that a drug works, that a drug is good for this, that a drug is bad for that, are they high quality, are they objective, are they being done uh, quickly enough to get drugs approved, are they do being done slowly enough to make sure they're careful, uh, what are the forces that might corrupt the scientific objectivity of these studies. Um, there's going to be this continual question about expert and scientific judgment. And today we have uh, a special guest with us who knows a lot about these issues um, and how they play out in some very particular fields. So we're, we're delighted to be joined by Lisa Cosgrove, who's an associate professor of clinical psychology at UMass Boston. And in addition to all the, the clinical work she's done throughout her career, her recent research has focused in particular in the way that you might have diagnostic biases in a lot of mental health work, uh, as well as conflict of interest policies for, for various sorts of medical institutions and medical researchers. So Lisa's going to introduce us to today a sort of um, specific case study and set of controversies that have um, been for many years brewing in the mental health community. Uh, this involves interactions with big pharmaceutical companies, questions about drug efficacy, questions about doctor prescribing practices, questions about financial interests that may go at various different levels, questions about what gets approved for reimbursement by uh, all sorts of health plans and the standards in which to get those things on a li approved list. Um, in many ways, it's sort of a perfect storm of a lot of these issues. Uh, and we hope Lisa will help lay on sort of the table today um, all the things, all the kind of things that can go wrong and be controversial in this literature. And on Thursday, we're going to have a discussion between uh, Larry and another pharmaceutical exp uh, expert um, about the larger industry and what sort of rules and regulations uh, govern it or ought govern it. So Lisa, without further ado, let me bring up the PowerPoint and uh, get us off to the races.
thank you today for talking about uh, some of your recent work and some of the problems of uh, drugs and mental health. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, thank you. Um, before I get started, am I mic'd? Um, um, before I get started, thank you. Yeah, okay. I just wanted to say that I'm going to be oh, talking okay, about some uh, psychotropic medications. And probably many of you know people who are on some of these medications. And so I just wanted to say real briefly what is a main takeaway and what's not a main takeaway from today. And what is a main takeaway is that we really don't know as much information about these medications that's marketed to us. What I don't want you to take away from my talk today is that these medications don't work. So again, um, the main point is that we don't know for whom they work best, and we don't know enough information about why they work. <coughs> so I want to start today with a story. It's a story that's been told lots of times, but it's a story um, that I think is important to tell again because I don't think we've learned the lessons from it. Um, some of you might be familiar, some of you might not. The ad on the right there is, fra is from about the year 2000, 2001. And I was looking for actually the print ad with the narrative, but couldn't find it. So you'll have to take my word that this is actually what it said. So PMDD stands for premenstrual dysphoric disorder. In around 2000, 2001, Eli Lilly began advertising um, in print and on radio, et cetera, for um, this new diagnosis, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And the ad specifically said, think it's PMS? Think again. It could be PMDD. Ask your doctor for a new medication to treat PMDD. The new medication is Seraphim that you can see up there. So you might say, well, what's the problem? We've identified a disorder, and now we have a new treatment for the disorder. Well, I think there's a lot of problems, one of which is informed consent. Whenever you go see your primary care physician, you want to know what's wrong with you, what the diagnosis is, what medication, if any, you're going to be given, and why that medication would work, and maybe some alternatives. Well, the problem in terms of the issue of informed consent is that <coughs> Seraphim and Prozac are the same drug. They're both fluoxetine hydrochloride. And as Marcia Angel noted in 2004, it's, the exactly, it's exactly the same drug, but in 2004 at least, Seraphim was priced three times higher at hers and everyone else's local pharmacy. So getting back to that issue of informed consent, the concern is, is that many women and probably many prescri prescribing providers weren't aware of the fact that Seraphim is fluoxetine is Prozac. So many women might have chosen to take Prozac, but they weren't aware that that's actually what they were taking. So as I said, one of the issues is informed consent. But another issue that relates right back to what Bill is talking about has to do with the money and the timing of what was going on at this point. And also the way in which the DSM, and this is going to be a theme of what I'll be talking about today, the way in which the DSM can play a subtle but a really powerful role in the decision about what medications to approve. And this is because the FDA only grants approval for a particular use or condition. So when the FDA grants um, drug approval, they don't just blanketly approve a drug. There has to be a condition for which they're approving it. So that's the uh, uh, money issue. Let's look at the timing issue. In 1999, Prozac's patent was about to expire. Now, actually, as it turned out, just inadvertently, they did get effectively a patent extension unrelated to this, but Eli Lilly had no way of knowing that would happen. So in, uh, prior to 99, Eli Lilly knew that they had a lot of money at stake. In fact, Prozac, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is often seen as the paradigmatic example of the blockbuster drug. And here you have a quote from a, a journalist pointing that out, that, you know, uh, since it launched um, in uh, 1988, and this is written in 2001, you're talking about $21 billion. You're talking about a tremendous amount of money. And that's why I like the quote at the bottom from the, from the journalist. It's not too much to say that Lilly is the house that Prozac built. Okay, so Lilly has a lot of money at stake. They're going to lose their, their patent on their best-selling drug and a drug that accounts for a significant percentage of the entire company's revenue. This is in 99. As I said, the FDA only grants um, uh, approval when there's a new condition. 
Now, what the FDA actually grants is what's called exclusivity. So they say, okay, Eli Lilly, you get three more years where you are the exclusive maker of this branded medication. It will not go generic. For a lay person like myself, I would consider that a patent extension. Technically or legally, it's not called a patent extension, but in terms of how it functions as far as revenue generation, it's effectively a patent extender. So Lilly clearly needed to get um, a new indication. So here is what I think the problem is, and that is it's in the multi-vested interests that um, are occurring. Specifically that um, what I discovered in beginning in 2004, 2005, and then a study that was published in 2006 is that most of the DSM panel members, that is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, who are responsible to determine is PMDD, is this thing premenstrual dysphoric disorder, is it a real disorder? So the, the very people, and there's just a few people, there are only six of them in the world that were charged with this authority it, to say is this a real disorder, had um, strong and long-lasting ties to Lilly, some of whom were also involved in providing expert testimony to Lilly, in other words, it, uh, to the FDA, in other words, saying, yes, PMDD is a real valid disorder. So you see where, or I hope you're beginning to see where there isn't a firewall between the scientists and the commercial interests. So the very people who have the authority to say, is this a real disorder, are also getting a lot of money from the company that has a vested interest in this being a, quote, real disorder. And then some of those people are providing expert testimony to the FDA saying, yes, this is a real disorder. So I think what this shows, or at least what it shows to me, is that there's at least the appearance, and I want to highlight that word, the appearance of that commercial interests rather than science might be influencing decisions about what disorders are included in the DSM and what drugs should be used to treat them. So I want to highlight that word appearance because I really like um, Dennis Thompson's um, definition and his discu brief discussion here because I want this to be a grounding feature of, of what I'm talking about today. And that is, he says, you know, conflicts of interest don't imply that any particular specific researcher is improperly motivated. It points rather to this generic risk that a financial conflict of interest could compromise the research process or undermine public trust. Thinking back on the story with Prozac, I think we could all agree that it raises the question of how trustworthy is the science that's being used to support the validity of this disorder and the treatments for it. Now, to its credit, in late 2006, early 2007, the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, those are the folks that produce the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorder, they developed a disclosure policy for the first time in the manual's 55 plus year history. And so that should be, you know, acknowledged. That's a step in the right, dire right direction. So prior to the um, revision of the DSM-5, and the DSM-5 came out um, just this past May in 2013, all of the folks who were responsible for any decisions about what new psychiatric disorder should be included, what changes in symptoms should take place, they had to post public disclosure statements in which they described, um, identified their financial ties to pharmaceutical companies. Now this is important because, and here you see the DSM-4TR on uh, the right side of the screen and on the, on the left you have the DSM-5. The DSM is often referred to as the Bible of psychiatric disorders. <laughs> Why? Because if you go to any therapeutic um, situation, if you go to any psychiatrist, psychologist, social worker, anytime you want third party reimbursement, anytime you want your insurance to cover your counseling sessions, your therapist has to give a DSM diagnosis. It doesn't matter how transient the problem is, it doesn't matter how much you're suffering, it doesn't matter the severity of the distress. Whenever there's going to be any kind of insurance reimbursement, there has to be a DSM code that's given. So your therapist has to give you uh, a DSM diagnosis. 
Also, um, with each new iteration of the DSM, there's increasing congruence with what's called the International Classification of Diseases, which is um, the international body that designates um, how to describe and how to numerically code the different diseases, which include then psychiatric diseases. So in um, 2012, um, Shelley Krimsky and I published a study in which we compared the um, percentage of DSM panel members uh, from the DSM-4 and the DSM-5. This slide's a little hard to read. Um, the main takeaway here is that in white are, uh, shows the percentages of the DSM-4 panel members who had ties, and in black, the bars show the DSM-5 panel members. So the main takeaway here is that nothing really changed as a result of the policy. Um, in 2006, we had found that um, the vast majority of uh, DSM panel members, the majority of DSM panel members had ties. We found the same thing. In 2006, we found that, um, and you can see this up here, that um, folks on the mood disorders panel and schizophrenia and psychotic disorders panel, 100% of the people had ties. Now, why is that important? That's important because if you were to go to a prescribing provider and you were given a, a mood disorder diagnosis or a diagnosis of psy a psychotic disorder, the frontline intervention is medication. So it's important to note that of the two groups that where all of the members had ties, those two groups are the groups um, for which pharmacological intervention is the frontline intervention. This is just a, a brief snapshot of what I just showed you to, that's easier to read to, so you can see. Has there been a decrease in some of the groups? Absolutely. You look at the mood disorders, went down from 100% to 67%. Um, same thing with the psychotic disorders. However, the point of this slide is to say, it, or at least what it says to me, is that while there's been some change, there hasn't been a significant change. And in fact, when you look at sleep-wake disorders, 100% have ties it's still um, the groups for whom pharmacological treatment is a frontline intervention where you have the most ties. Um, sleep weight disorders, restless leg syndrome, some of you might be surprised to know that's actually considered a mental disorder in the DSM. So um, the sleep weight disorders, if you are diagnosed with one, you are definitely or almost definitely going to be given a prescription for medication, not um, reimbursement for yoga sessions or meditation. We also found that there was actually an increase, um, an increase in the percentage of task force members who had ties to industry. Now, the task force members are, um, have decision-making authority above the panel members. The individual panel members, for example, the mood disorder panel members, are uh, responsible for the mood disorders. The task force members provide oversight. So they have a tremendous amount of authority in terms of what exactly gets included in the DSM and what doesn't get included. And the fact that we see a significant increase in ties tells me that, unfortunately, although it would appear that transparency was a step in the right direction, nothing really has changed, which is why I really like this quote from Foucault. It's not that everything is bad, it's that everything is dangerous. So to me, transparency is dangerous in this Foucaultian sense, in the sense that it makes us feel better. It makes us feel like, oh, okay, we're, we're moving in the right direction. There's, there's um, some oversight, there's checks and balances, when in fact the same problems might actually be in place and might actually be exacerbated um, by transparency. Now, oh, go ahead, sure. That's a great question. Um, I mean dangerous in the way I think Foucault means it, in that it, it makes you think that there's linear progress when in fact it might have a regressive or unintended effect. So dangerous in the sense that um, it gives the appearance that we've solved a problem when the problem might still be in place. 
So I think your question is really good because it, it gets to the issue of implicit bias and gets back to Dennis Thompson's point and, and what Professor Lessig has talked about, and that is, you know, we're not trying to say in any way that an individual researcher committed fraud. In fact, I don't think that's the main problem. I think the problem is in the implicit bias and in the potential decrease of trust that can be incurred when you see those financial ties. But you know, maybe that's a good segue, actually, to the, this question. But why should we care if, they, if DSM panel members have um, uh, ties to industry? Why should that matter? Why is that a public health issue? Right? As long as psychiatry relies on best practices, the principles of evidence-based medicine, there should be little concern that we have a major problem. We could say, OK, maybe individual clinicians aren't trained that well, and they might ha you know, be more likely to have a misdiagnosis. But as far as a systemic problem that would lead to a, a, a really big uh, public health problem, as long as we follow best practices, we're fine, right? Well, let's, let's just take a, um, a quick little quiz. So according to best practices and, and evidence-based psychiatry, before a diagnosis of schizophrenia can be made, some of you might have taken a few psych courses, so you might know the answer, would it be A, an MRI is needed in order to determine if abnormalities in the limbic system are consistent with abnormalities of psychotic patients, or B, should, according to best practices, we give a blood test to confirm that dopamine levels are consistent with a diagnosis of schizophrenia? Or C, should there be genetic testing, although we have to recognize that there could be a high false positive rate, and if we use genetic testing according to best practices, um, that should be used in combination with a scanning technique like an MRI or some sort of blood test? What do you think? Anybody? Very good, very good. In fact, most individuals who are diagnosed with schizophrenia have no family history of psychosis, and genetic testing is therefore not needed or recommended. And in fact, according to best practices, a diagnosis can and is usually given in the absence of absolutely any testing, neuropsych testing, psychological testing, or biological testing. So why do I bring that up? I bring that up because it points to what uh, a number, and uh, thankfully, in my opinion, an increasing number of prominent psychiatrists are talking about, and that is the way in which psychiatry is different from other medical subspecialties. <laughs> and so I really like this quote by Alan Francis, who was a former chair of the DSM. And he notes that even though there have been these incredible advances in neuroscience and biology and brain imaging, and they've you know, provided us with a lot of information. We know a lot more about the brain than we did. We, it hasn't really informed psychiatric practice. And as he says very clearly, the clearest evidence supporting this disappointing fact is that there is not even one biological test that was ready for inclusion in the DSM-5. And here's another quote by a prominent uh, psychiatrist that speaks to what Francis is saying and I think is really important and, and shows a much needed humility and uh, is a very honest statement. And, you know, as you can see, what he's saying is, you know, psychiatrists um, will never have a biomedical science that's similar to other subdisciplines in medicine. And it's not because they're bad doctors. It's because the issues they deal with are of a very different nature. And he sums it up well when he says, psychiatry is not neurology. It's not a medicine of the brain. So the point here is that what differentiates psychiatry from other medical subspecialties is that there are no biological markers, no biological tests for any of the DSM disorders, whether we're talking about bipolar, schizophrenia, depression, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, any of the disorders, there are no biological markers. And I think that makes it more vulnerable to industry influence and subjective bias than other medical subspecialties. Now certainly other medical subspecialties where there are biological markers can be, have uh, industry influence them in ways that are inappropriate. We saw that, um, well, you guys are too young to probably notice this, but there was some, a lot of controversy around um, the use of statins and the cholesterol guidelines that recently came out. So um, certainly industry, or it, there was controversy about how much 
influence industry was exerting about what constituted high cholesterol, low cholesterol, good cholesterol, when should statins be used. But the fact of the matter is, at least you have some blood levels. You, they can be um, up for uh, discussion around what should constitute high or low cholesterol and at what point medication should be given, but at least you have a place to draw a line in the sand. With um, DSM disorders, it, it relies completely on people's subjective judgment, and that's where I think it, psychiatry is more vulnerable to industry influence. And here, um, what we're really talking about is the false positive problem. That is the problem of overdiagnosis, the problem of pathologizing things that 10, 20, 30 years ago wouldn't even be considered um, major problems, let alone um, forms of a, a mental illness. So let me give um, an example of that. I'm assuming that most of you have siblings. So what I'd like to do is, um, if, especially for those of you that had a younger sibling, um, think about what I'm going to show in terms of when your younger sibling was about 11, 12, 13 years old. Or if you were the younger sibling, think about it in terms of yourself. Like I was the younger sibling, so I can, I can relate to this. So imagine when your younger sibling was 11, 12, 13. Did he or she ever blame you or other people for your mistakes? Did he or she actively defy your parents? requests, not comply with the rules, did they seem kind of cranky, touchy, easily annoyed, or my personal favorite, did they ever deliberately annoy you and your friends? <laughs> or did you ever deliberately annoy your siblings' friends? Well, you may or may not be surprised to know that this is actually a DSM disorder. Here, it, this is the exact um, symptom criteria from the DSM. So a pattern of negativistic and or defiant behavior lasting at least six months during which four, that's why the previous slide I gave you four, um, are present. Often loses temper, I'm not gonna read it, you can all read that, um, is, la is touchy, easily annoyed, angry or resentful, etc. So if there are four of those symptoms, you can now go back home over the next break and tell your sibling that they actually had oppositional defiant disorder, which is a DSM disorder. Now, on the one hand, you could say this is deeply problematic. On the other hand, a, cri a critic of mine could say, well, look, isn't the APA saying, look at the word often, right? So we're saying often loses temper, often actively defies others. We're saying, hey, this isn't your average pain in the neck sibling. This is somebody whose behavior is more egregious. It's outside the scope of what we would consider to be normal pain in the neck adolescent behavior. So what's the problem? We have the word often. Well, the problem as I see it is my often isn't Bill's often, isn't your often. And that's where you can have a public health problem because there can be this overdiagnosis when you're relying completely on subjective interpretation. There's no, remember, there's no biological markers. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe speak to what incentives like insurance companies might have in situations like this, because I feel like they don't want like generic to be like, heavily extended for their patents that they need, so they're gonna have to pay more. And especially if it's like, when you're talking about things that are more subjective, I feel like it's also gonna be that's a good question. I haven't studied the influence. That's a, that's a good example of another economy of influence, I think, on psychiatric uh, diagnostic and treatment guidelines. I haven't studied the, um, the insurance industry. To the APA's credit, what they say, and people could argue that it's a disingenuous statement, but what they say is they have developed the scientific instrument. I think I might have the, uh, I don't know if I have the DSM. Oh, I have it here. They have developed the scientific instrument, the DSM-5, outside of any concerns, uh, third-party concerns, outside of the legal system, outside of the insurance companies, et cetera. Um, but nonetheless, we know the reality of the situation is that a DSM diagnosis is tied, and increasingly so, because what, what I see as a clinician is um, the insurance companies will dictate, for example, the number of sessions that will be allowed on, on the virtue of the diagnosis given.
first course of action to take. So I'm, I mean, it might sound like a silly question, but I'm just wondering if, if it's not a medicine of the brain, why are we, are we giving, medicine? why are we prescribing? I think that's a brilliant question, and I think that's one that the APA um, needs to answer more thoroughly and thoughtfully. And what I'm going to talk about in just a couple of minutes is, um, is the fact that uh, what the APA suggests in terms of treatment is very different than what other countries suggest. And um, I'm going to talk about that in terms of what does that mean for evidence-based medicine. If it's evidence-based and we're looking at the same evidence, we should be coming up with generally the same kinds of recommendations. You mentioned that there needs to be a diagnosis of something in order to sit down with a therapist. Is that the case for you have to have a diagnosis to sit down with an MD or with the PsyD? Anytime there's insurance coverage. It doesn't matter what licensed professional is making the diagnosis. It doesn't matter if it's a master's level, a PhD level, MD. It's the insurance that requires, it's actually the ICD code. So there has to be a numerical code. I, another good question. Um, then there could be under treatment, and then there could be an exacerbation of symptoms. For example, if you don't catch depression, and then the person develops an even deeper um, level of depression. So there's certainly that's that's a good point. I should have said something about that. I mean, there's the other side of it that if you're not um, if if the um, uh, problem isn't identified, then there isn't an intervention, and that could lead to even more problems. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay. So the point here is that um, although the APA, to its credit, is trying to say, hey, you know, in this case with oppositional defiant disorder, this behavior is outside the norm of most adolescents' behavior, it's, it's squishy, right? Just because you use the word often, that doesn't really give people much to base the, um, the diagnosis on. So. Here are some new diagnoses that are included in the DSM-5. So just in case you thought you were normal, I'm, I bet you could come up with a few of the uh, different diagnoses. Binge eating disorder we'll talk about in a moment. Autism spectrum disorder. This one is uh, a, an interesting case um, because uh, in the DSM-4, there was, some of you might be aware, um, there's what's called Asperger's disorder. Asperger's disorder has been eliminated from the DSM and in its place, we um, don't talk about the specific pervasive developmental disorder like Rett's disorder or childhood disintegrative disorder or Asperger's. We now use the um, disorder autism spectrum. Now, what's interesting to me about this is the advocates of this change are saying, and it, from the data, it does appear this is accurate, that, the, that it, on the basis particularly of genetic data, um, it, it looks like it's more helpful and accurate to understand the pervasive developmental disorders as a spectrum disorder. But the flip side of that is that whenever you have a spectrum disorder, you open it up, I think, for the potential for the widening of boundaries. So I think we have to be careful here, and I just bring that up because I, I wanted to put on a slide some of the more controversial diagnoses. Um, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Um, the APA initially wanted to call that temper dysregulation disorder, but they got a lot of pushback. It's, can, it's now in the mood disorders, but it's a disorder that's only diagnosed in childhood from the ages of 6 to 18. And it's basically a disorder where um, the hallmarks uh, in terms of symptomatology are irritable mood and temper tantrums. Temper tantrums that the DSM describes as being um, more frequent and more intense than most children and that occur more often. Again, a very fine attempt to say, hey, it's outside the norm of what most kids would do. But what I consider a m m temper tantrum, either in its display or its frequency, could be different and is different from many other clinicians. And there's no real basis upon which to decide what constitutes a more irritable mood of a four-year-old or a six-year-old than um, a less irritable mood. And so the concern here, and we'll talk about this at the very end, is the intervention, and this is one of the RCTs that's in the pipeline, is an atypical antipsychotic for, the, for kids. So my concern would be that six, seven, eight-year-old kids who are identified as having um, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder will then be put on an atypical antipsychotic. 
for effectively what some people could say are temper tantrums. Mild neurocognitive disorder, this was another really controversial disorder. Why? Because um, according to the DSM-5, you could make this diagnosis in the absence of any testing, any psych or neuropsych testing. Um, and it, it, um, part of the symptom criteria was that the, the dysfunction, the cognitive dysfunction was not sufficient enough to interfere with daily activities and all you really needed was the person by report or an informant to say that there have been some uh, mild cognitive problems. Examples were forgetting when, where one put one's keys, not finding one's cell phone. I mean, things that you know many people could relate to, particularly um, as you get older. So the, the facetious uh, response was basically this could be a disorder that could be diagnosed for anyone in their 50s or 60s. Um, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, we just talked about that. Very controversial diagnosis because um, there's been a lot of research to suggest that it's not a valid disorder. Um, a lot of folks have said, yes, the women might have um, somatic symptoms, but it certainly should not be considered a mental disorder. And as we talked about in the very beginning, there's the um, multi-vested interest in terms of Eli Lilly with Seraphim and Prozac. And then finally, one of the more um, contentious changes in the DSM-5 was the elimination of the bereavement exclusion for major depressive disorder. In the DSM-4, there was a caveat that said um, major depressive disorder should not be diagnosed in folks who have recently experienced a loss of a loved one. Um, certainly not after two weeks, because the criteria for major depressive disorder is that there have to be five symptoms over a two-week period. Symptoms like loss of appetite, difficulty sleeping, feeling hopeless, sad, etc. So the, in the DSM-4, the folks were really clear and said, hey, you know, if somebody's lost a loved one, do not give a diagnosis of major depressive disorder. This is the normal process of grief. But the APA voted to eliminate the bereavement exclusion. So this means that um, someone who's lost a partner, a child, a good friend, whomever, um, two and a half weeks and goes to see their PCP, um, and the PCP looks up the criteria in the DSM, um, the person would be diagnosed with major depressive disorder, and the concern would be that the treatment would not be, oh, would you like to go to a support group? Would you like to talk to somebody? But rather, as we'll see in a moment, Zimbalta is in the pipeline for um, grief, for bereavement-related depression. So the concern is that not only are you pathologizing what's a normal, albeit sad, part of human experience, you know, you lose someone that you love, but you're treating it with a pill when it's part of the normal uh, process to go through that. So let's take a look at um, the binge eating disorder. Now, I highlight this because this is in the DSM-5. You don't have anorexia or bulimia, so that's important. This occurs in the absence of any symptoms of anorexia or bulimia. So binge eating disorder just requires three, di three symptoms. Have you, in the last, uh, at least once a week, over the last week, eaten more rapidly than normal? eaten until uncomfortably full, eaten large amounts of food even when not physically hungry, then according to the DSM, you have binge eating disorder. <laughs> now, do, so, do all of us overeat occasionally? Yes. Is this a problem particularly in the United States? Yes. But should we <laughs> see this as an individual problem of pathology? I don't think so. And especially as we'll talk about in a moment, there are three drugs in the pipeline to treat binge eating disorder. And that's what led, this is a, a recent former president of the American Psychiatric Association to note, you know, it's these flexible boundaries of the DSM disorders that are the real problem. And the real problem is that they can create opportunities for industry to promote treatments, as we just saw with binge eating disorder, um, three different drugs in the pipeline, for people who wouldn't even be seen as having a mental disorder 10 years ago which is why some people feel this way. <laughs> Certainly, probably people um, inside of industry, so everyone has a disorder. <laughs> Although I tend to feel this way. But regardless of how you feel about the DSM, the DSM 
informs treatment. Diagnosis informs treatment. It is really important. I don't think it should be referred to as the Bible of psychiatric disorders, but nonetheless, particularly in the United States, where there's the connection with the insurance companies um, in order to have any sort of um, intervention, it's, it's, it, it's an extremely influential instrument. So diagnosis informs treatment. And so I'm going to segue into talking about um, the ways in which APA's clinical practice guidelines, that is guidelines about treatment, um, might be affected by these financial conflicts of interest. Um, but before I do that, I thought it might be fun for you to pick out which one of these is not a heading from the onion. <laughs> Man stays up all night rocking cat to sleep. Uh, McDonald's offers bereavement prices. The company is proud to support customers in their t darkest era, uh, hour of sorrow. Or the American Psychiatric Association recommends electroconvulsive shock therapy as a first-line treatment for mild depression for patients who prefer it. <laughs> By now, you know what the answer is, right? The, the answer is the last one. The last one is not a heading from the onion. That is actually what the APA recommends. Now, um, the APA also recommends antidepressant medication as a treatment for mild, um, uh, for all levels of, de of depression, but I'm going to talk about mild to moderate depression. Now, this is really important, I think, because in the United States, the vast majority of um, antidepressant um, prescriptions are written by non-psychiatrist physicians. So it's typically a general practitioner, an internist, a primary care physician who's writing the script for um, the antidepressants. So they really turn to APA's guidelines in terms of what should I do. A patient comes into them, they think it's ADHD or they think it's depression, they, they go to their computer and they turn to the guidelines. So I think a really important question is, do antidepressants work? If they work, for whom do they work? What does the evidence tell us? Well, there have been a number of uh, meta-analyses. Does everybody know what a meta-analysis is? A meta-analysis is when you aggregate uh, a lot of data. In this case, we're talking about randomized control trials, trials of drugs, in order to, make, uh, to try to make some sort of definitive statement about the efficacy or the safety, in this case, of medication. So there have been a number of, of meta-analyses of antidepressants um, to look at that question of, do antidepressants work? If so, for whom? I'm going to talk about two of the most influential and important ones that were incorporated in a number of guidelines, including the APA's guidelines, but also in guidelines of other countries. So this is by um, Irvin Kirsch. And on the bottom, you'll see that he used a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act, to get unpublished data. This was brilliant on his part, I think. Nobody was doing this. He started this in, like, 2006. Nobody was doing this at the time. Why it was brilliant is because there is a real publication bias, at least in the medical literature, where um, uh, positive findings tend to get reported and negative findings don't. In fact, there's a famous study by uh, Turner in his lab in about, uh, I think, 2005, where uh, there were 70-some um, RCTs, randomized clinical trials, of um, antidepressants that he looked at. And approximately half found positive results and half found negative results. And over 90% of the positive results were, in other words, that the drug worked, were published, but only 8% of the ones that said that the drug didn't work were published. So there's, a, so there's a documented publication bias in favor of branded medication. So the fact that Irvin Kirsch used a Freedom of Information Act to get all of the data, all of the randomized clinical trials, was really important because this allowed him to make sure that his data set was as full and accurate and balanced as possible. So he does a meta-analysis of four main classes of SSRIs. What does he say? This is an exact quote. Given the data, there seems little evidence to support the prescription of antidepressant medication to even the most severely depressed patients unless alternative treatments have failed to provide benefit. Very clear. That's his conclusion. Then we have um, Fournier's group. Um, this was published in JAMA in 2010. Um, it adds significantly to um, Kirsch's, not to get too much into the methodology, but Fournier's was a patient-level analysis, whereas 
um, Irvin Kirsch and his group looked at it in terms of group means. So here you have two different kinds of meta-analyses. So they're it's really robust, the conclusion that they can draw. So Fernier's group says, efforts should be made to clarify to clinicians and prospective patients there's little evidence to suggest that antidepressants produce specific pharmacological benefit for the majority of patients with less severe acute depressions. Again, very clear, right? What's the takeaway? If you have mild depression, antidepressants should not be the frontline medication. So, how are these meta-analyses interpreted in APA's most recent guideline for depression? This is what um, you would read if you were a PCP looking up APA's guidelines. Response rates typically range from 50 to 75 percent, with some evidence suggesting greater efficacy relative to placebo for those folks who have more severe depressive symptoms. So what would your takeaway be if you just read this and you didn't go back and read the original Kirsch and Fournier. Your takeaway would be, hey, antidepressants are pretty effective. They seem to be more effective for people with severe depressions, but they're effective, you know, on the whole for everyone. And by the way, the APA in this section, they cite Kirsch and Fournier's work to make this statement. And this is um, on page 17 of their, of their guideline. Antidepressant medication is recommended as an initial treatment choice for patients with mild to moderate major depressive disorder. I would say that's discordant with what Kirsch and Fournier are saying. It's very discordant with what they're saying. Um, let's look at what other guidelines, well first let's look at, um, this is the only chart in the APA's guideline, the only figure that they have. And which makes it unusual. Clinical practice guidelines are seen as the standard of care for evidence-based medicine. You know, no matter if you go to a uh, orthopedist or uh, respiratory uh, medicine expert, um, the guidelines that they use are seen as what they should be using in order to provide the best care. And if there was any litigation, We'll probably come back to did they rely on the um, clinical care guidelines. So here's the American Psychiatric Association's clinical care guidelines. The way they're different from other medical specialties is usually there's some decision tree or algorithm, you know, if this, do X, if not, do Y, and it's a stepped model. Um, APAs doesn't have this, and this is their only chart. So here you can see that for mild to moderate, they do also recommend psychotherapy, although they say uh, medication should be the front line. And as you can see, they also recommend electroconvulsive shock therapy for certain patients, and then narratively say for the patient who prefers it. Um, now, my colleagues and I all looked at, we did a quality assessment of APA's guideline for major depressive disorder. We found that the um, less than half of the RCTs, the randomized trials that they were um, referencing to support their recommendation of medication met the criteria for high quality, and we had a very low standard for high quality. For example, they had to enroll depressed patients, um, they had to use patient-centered outcomes, um, and the fact that less than half um, met the criteria, uh, along with a few other metrics that we used, suggested to us that um, there was questionable uh, quality of the APA's guideline. We also looked at the composition of the guideline development group. All of the members of the guideline development group had, were members of APA. Um, all of them had ties to the financial companies that manufacture antidepressants, and the majority of them were Speakers Bureau members. Now, this is really important because um, most uh, folks have recognized that participation on a Speakers Bureau is basically uh, a marketing function. It's not a scientific function. In fact, the majority of medical schools, if not all of them at this point, say that, hey, if you're going to be on the faculty of our medical school, you cannot also be on a Speakers Bureau of a pharmaceutical or medical device manufacturer because we can't be assured that you're going to be teaching our medical students accurate and unbiased information. I put KOLs in parentheses there because that's how they're referred to in industry as key opinion leaders. So industry insiders know that they're targeting Dr. X at Stanford University to be a key opinion leader to change the prescription habits of doctors around the country. So the majority of the guideline authors were on speakers bureaus or were key opinion leaders. So let's compare 
APA's guidelines with some other guidelines. Um, the guidelines out of the UK, that is the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, spe Excellence, specifically addresses the harm benefit ratio and says very specifically that antidepressant medication should not be the first line choice for individuals with mild depression. And they cite Hirsch and Fournier's uh, meta-analyses as evidence for this. So again, APA is citing Kirsch and Fournier, but they're citing them to support the use of antidepressant medication as a frontline intervention, whereas here, at least we see with uh, the NICE guidelines, they're using Kirsch and Fournier's work to say, hey, we've got to look at the harm-benefit ratio. Also, recent Dutch guidelines only recommended, recommended as a frontline intervention, that's the first line intervention, medication in the cases of severe depression. And this is a, the exact quote from out of the UK from the NICE guidelines. Um, don't use antidepressants routinely to treat persistent subhold um, depressive symptoms or mild depression because the risk, risk benefit ratio is poor. Uh, have you sure for any, like commented on like APA's guidelines saying, yo, <laughs> um, I would like to see that. Uh, Kirsch, I know that Irvin Kirsch has spoken out about it, and um, the APA had just said that they stand by what they wrote in the guideline. But I think that would be very interesting to have a, a roundtable discussion, to have a conversation. I think it's a really good idea. Um, my students and I just compared, we're, we're going to systematically compare all the guidelines for depression, but just taking a snapshot, we looked at guidelines um, out of the US, out of the UK, out of Spain, and out of Netherlands, just for mild depression. And here you can see, I think this is a nice visual, where you can clearly see that we're the only guideline that recommends antidepressant medication as a frontline intervention. Um, uh, all the other ones do not do this. They opt for things like lifestyle interventions, um, exercise, for example. Low intensity psychological refers to things like um, internet-based uh, problem solving, internet-based uh, real basic cognitive <coughs> behavioral therapy interventions, and then psychotherapy. So when you see this, I think it's an important um, question to say, hey, if we're talking about evidence-based medicine, we're looking at the same evidence. Why are we drawing such, such vastly different conclusions? And might this have some public health, profound public health implications? So, okay, here, we're, go, oh yeah, I need to go back to the, thank you. To go, we'll start back. So this is a, a, a Billify commercial. Some of you might have seen this but we'll just take a moment and listen to it, and I'd like to talk about it. Here's me, and here's my depression. Before I started taking Abilify, I was taking an antidepressant alone. Most days, I could put on a brave face and muddle through, but other days, I still struggled with my depression. I was managing, but it always had a way of creeping up on me. I felt stuck. I just couldn't shake my depression, so I talked to my doctor. He said adding Abilify to my antidepressant could help with my depression, and that some people had symptom improvement as early as one to two weeks. He also told me about a free trial offer from Abilify. Now, I feel more in control of my depression. Abilify is not for everyone. Call your doctor if your depression worsens or if you have unusual changes in behavior or thoughts of suicide. Antidepressants can increase these in children, teens, and young adults. Elderly dementia patients taking Abilify have an increased risk of death or stroke. Call your doctor if you have high fever, stiff muscles, and confusion to address a possible life-threatening condition, or if you have uncontrollable muscle movements, as these could become permanent. High blood sugar has been reported with Abilify and medicines like it. In some cases, extreme high blood sugar can lead to coma or death. Other risks include decreases in white blood cells, which can be serious, dizziness upon standing, seizures, trouble swallowing, and impaired judgment or motor skills. Depression used to define me. Then my doctor added Abilify to my antidepressant. Now, I feel better. If you are still struggling with depression, talk to your doctor to see if the option of adding Abilify is right for you. And be sure to ask about the free trial offer. OK, there's a number of things that we could talk about there. Um, but in, in order to uh, make sure we have enough time, Um, in order to make sure we have enough time, I'll go to the slide in a second. I wanted to point out uh, two things. One, I wanted to ask, and I only want to ask those of you who don't know what Abilify is. 
So for those of you who don't know what Abilify is, just from watching this commercial, what would you think Abilify is? A supplement to antidepressants. And in fact, in the print ads, that's exactly how they refer to it. They say, try Abilify. It's an add-on to your antidepressant. However, what is Abilify? Does anybody know? It's an antipsychotic. So again, getting back to that issue of informed consent, maybe people who are struggling with depression would want to take an antipsychotic, but they should know that they're taking an antipsychotic and not a supplement to their antidepressant. And in fact, um, this is again where there's discordance between APA's recommendations and the recommendations of other clinical practice guidelines, at least the ones we've looked at internationally. No other international guideline, no other guideline recommends augmentation of an, an antipsychotic psychotic um, for depression. A APA is the only one um, that does that. Again, we're only basing it on four, um, but my hunch is that's probably going to be true across the board. So APA is the only one that recommends augmentation for antidepressants for all levels. So that's mild depression. So what APA actually says is after four weeks, if someone comes in with mild depression, they've never been depressed before, and after four, you've given them an antidepressant, and after four weeks the antidepressant isn't working, try another antidepressant, then after two failed antidepressant trials, add another um, medication, and in this case it's considered a, quote, atypical antipsychotic. Um, and this is why I think we're seeing polypharmacy so prevalent in the United States, because instead of discontinuing the medication, I mean, a legitimate question to ask if your antidepressant isn't working is, why not, why are you taking it, or why don't you try something else, not let's add another antidepressant and another medication. So um, I think this speaks again to a real problem in the quality that I think might be related to the financial ties with industry, real a problem with the quality of APAs um, clinical practice guidelines. Um, I'm also going to look at it in terms of um, the recommendation for electroconvulsive shock therapy because my hunch is that we're the only country that would recommend ECT for mild depression. At least I, I hope we are. Um, so diagnosis informs treatment, right? That's one of the main um, points and I want to try to finish up so that we have time to talk. So one of the main takeaways is, and that was the article that was assigned to you, is could the DSM-5 operate inadvertently as a vehicle for high profit patent extensions? In other words, could Zimbalta be today's Prozac? And the reason I ask that question is, you'll notice, as I mentioned before, is that we have a trial, Eli Lilly has a trial for Zimbalta for bereavement related depression, for grief, as well as for binge eating disorder. And there's a lot of money at stake. For those of you that read the article, you're aware of that. Right? It, um, uh, Zimbalta accounted for 24% of Eli Lilly's profits. And just in the last quarter of 2012, it accounted for one point, I think it was two something billion dollars. That was the last quarter of 2012. The patent for Prozac expired in December. And here we see RCTs in the pipeline. Now again, Eli Lilly has a right and a fiduciary responsibility, I guess people could say, to the shareholders to increase their profit. There's nothing wrong with Lilly trying to find a, a new indication. And in fact, I, I perhaps am naive enough to believe that I think that there could be executives who really do believe that, hey, Zimbalt is this great drug, so maybe it could work for other things too. But the problem as I see it is that there isn't the firewall to protect the public, a firewall between the science and the commercial interest. And that's what um, my colleague Shelley and I um, from Tufts did here with my graduate students is looked at what were the drugs that were in the pipeline for DSM-5 disorders before the DSM-5 came out? Now that's an interesting question because getting back right to the FDA, how uh, could the um, folks know that they were going to be included in the DSM prior to the publication of the DSM? The way that they could is because you see the, the interconnections among the companies. So here, there's a lot of money at stake. Are there limitations to our study? Absolutely. It's really small. There, we're talking about a uh, very few number of RCTs, relatively small number of, of drugs. Um, we have to be really cautious about drawing generalizations. But to me, at least, it speaks to a more systemic problem that I've found that conceptual framework of institutional corruption to be very, very useful. 
um, for. So if you take anything away, if there's only one thing you take away from this little talk today, that is that I think that financial conflicts of interest can function in subtle but really, really powerful ways so that it shifts the direction of the research. And I mean that at every level. So it shifts the kinds of questions people ask, and it also shifts um, the focus in terms of what interventions are going to be studied in ways that might be certainly commercially attractive, but not necessarily represent the best science. And so I just want to end with, um, again, emphasizing that I don't think that there's this Machiavellian plot. I don't think that the APA panel members are these bad, evil people, you know, doing backdoor deals. Um, I think, again, that the issue of research fraud is actually pretty small, and I think we have pretty good ways of dealing with it, identifying it. But the problem is really, as you've heard a few weeks ago, um, it's about implicit bias and the way in which we're all prone to implicit biases. It's part of the human condition to remain in denial about them. Or said more simply, it's a title of one of my favorite books, Mistakes Were Made, but not by me. Um, because I think that speaks to this fact that we, we do often fail to see the ways in which our implicit biases can affect our behavior. And here's a good example of this. Um, Daniel Regier, who's the head of the um, DSM-5, said in response to a study that I had done in 2009, well, doesn't she realize there's an assumption that a tie with a company is evidence of bias, but these people can be objective. And he really believes that. He really believes that. And that, I think, is what the problem is. It, again, they're not bad people. It's that they, they really believe they can be objective when they might not be able to be as objective as they think they can. And that potential lack of objectivity could have profound public health implications. Why might they not be quite as objective? Well, again, I love quotes, so this is one of my favorite ones to end on. I think because it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon his not understanding it. So I hope we, we do have time for some questions. Yeah, great question. So we just looked at um, the financial conflicts of the guideline developers of those um, other international guidelines. And some of them had certainly had ties. Nothing as egregious uh, as APA's ties, and far fewer. So I think that's one of the issues. Um, the uh, issue also is that um, the other uh, folks the guideline developers in other countries in Europe had a more multidisciplinary group, so they were they weren't adhering to IOM's most recent standards because they're not they don't have to, but they were just living them out. So the Institute of Medicine has recently come out and said, when you develop a guideline, you should have a multidisciplinary group because it's not just financial conflicts of interest, right? It's the it's the guild's interest, it's the medical specialty's interest. Um, and you should have a methodologist because he or she won't have any vested interest in what the data, how the data come out. So they tended to have, even, even the guideline groups that had some <coughs> folks with ties, tended to be interdisciplinary and have methodologists and have an independent review panel that seemed to be really genuine. The independent review panel for APA, they actually had undisclosed ties, we found out. And they were APA members. So to me, it seemed like a really disingenuous process. To, to my knowledge, no. Um, folks are looking at, in fact, I know of somebody, and it's in Irving Kirsch's lab, interesting research to look at um, what might be some 
genetic markers of why certain people are placebo responders, which is an interesting sort of tangential but related um, uh, response. But to my knowledge, no, there isn't an, an SSRI out there that, that fits with the way you're describing. Sure. Good, good question, yeah. Um, that's another thing that I think is a, is a problem in APA's guideline. They don't address discontinuation, when to discontinue. They say, um, they, I, they phrase it, I think it's like, when it's discontinued, taper it slowly. Whereas other guidelines will say, after a positive response of six months, to start to discontinue. So APA doesn't provide those guidelines. To specifically answer your question, I think um, people need to take a more active part um, in their own treatment and, and go to whoever the prescribing provider was and say, you know, I'd like to discontinue this if that indeed is what they wish to do. And to realize that some of the SSRIs, I know Paxil is one of the ones that's more difficult to discontinue and so even the tapering can be difficult. But I think the, I guess the short answer would be people need to take a more active role in the discontinuation because that's not normative in the United States. They're used for anxiety, right. So is it the same idea where like, they're also overprescribed the same way? Yes, and in fact, um, th this is really dismaying <coughs> to me, is that um, there isn't even the RCT evidence base to suggest that antidepressants should be used for, um, uh, for anxiety. That's just based on expert opinion, and that's been a really uh, marketing coup, in my opinion, of the companies. If you did a, a Medline search, even with a publication bias, you would see that the vast majority of research shows that it, it's not efficacious for, um, for anxiety. And yet, this is the mindset of prescribing providers. They really believe it, and they'll say, oh, but I've had a positive response. And you know, they, that certainly could be that they've seen lots of clients with a positive response, but again, that's why we do RCTs. Maybe they're actually good therapists. <laughs> and the positive response has to do with the rapport they've developed and not a pharmacological benefit of the drug. That's a good question. Um, yeah, my, my thinking has shifted a lot. It's been gr great being affiliated with the lab because it hel has helped my thinking. So initially, one of the things that I thought was that um, there could be a balance that um, folks, that, for example, on the DSM panels, there should be people um, without ties. You shouldn't have any panel with uh, that had the majority. Now I've come to think that there just shouldn't be people with, with ties at all because it's too much of an issue. And in fact, I think it's a disingenuous argument that we can't find experts without ties. Uh, another, um, I don't know how easy to implement this would be, but to either use an incentivizing structure so that pharmaceutical companies would be given some sort of tax incentive or, or taxed, um, the, the stick version, and have those monies be pooled. Initially, I thought if you had them pooled, and then had researchers from different universities studying the drugs, that would be enough. But I think the firewall should be where you take those pooled monies and, you, and researchers study, quote, alternative um, interventions like exercise, um, because I don't think even pooling the money is enough. But I think at least that would be a start. So you, you pool the money from the pharmaceutical companies, uh, maybe NIMH divvies it up, and either um, supports al alternative or supports at least um, RCTs that aren't, um, <coughs> where you don't see a clear connection between one pharmaceutical company and one researcher. So those would be two just brief possibilities. Well, wow, that's a, <laughs> let's see, we've got four minutes. Um, 
So I think I, I um, I think it's a problem with the with the approach of the DSM with the medical model. I think that um, it's psychiatry's and psychology's break with philosophy that's been our downfall. Would be the short answer. I think the the using the medical model to understand something as complicated as human experience or human distress is just going down the wrong path. How you address that, I don't you know in any sort of realistic way. I don't know, but I think that the philosophical grounding of our most authoritative document is deeply flawed. There's a statistic for the like the CDC in 2001 said that between 1988 and 2008, there is an increase of like 400% in use of depressive syndrome. And my question is, I know that I just remember a New York Times article about like pharma apocalypse and this whole danger of over-medicating the, the world, and it's, it's a global phenomenon. But I, I have a question for you that is, is, is what would be the educational campaign that necessary to, that we could like, make medication work for us? Because you said that pharma is Oh, wow. I don't know. Um, Again, I think we'd have to uh, put more effort into supporting what we're currently calling, and I don't like to continue calling it alternative interventions, you know, like things as simple as exercise. The guidelines from the Netherlands do a really good job talking about something that, um, that our guidelines don't, which is that in the vast majority of cases, depression lifts, it abates. It stinks while people go through it, but, you know, for, for the majority of people, after six months, the depression abates. So education around the fact that that can be a normal part of human experience, um, education around the benefits of exercise. I think it's practically malpractice to that um, PCPs or therapists don't tell people who are mildly depressed to exercise, that there, there's no downside to, to, to exercise at all. So those would be just two quick things, but I, I see it as such a, a difficult problem that I think it needs many, many interventions. So you need the regulatory interventions that we were talking about, the philosophical interventions, and then the educational campaign, campaign interventions. Oh, sorry. Is there another question? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, so people felt that there were people who were grieving who fell outside the scope and who weren't getting the treatment that they needed. And so the advocates were um, saying, you know, there are people who go through this prolonged and severe gr grief and we really do need to identify them and provide them with services. And I think that's a very truthful and a, and a legitimate and important point of view. The concern is that you know, you see Zimbalta up there, and I hope I'm wrong, but I would not be shocked if in a year from now we see a commercial that says, where does grief hurt? It hurts all over. Try Zimbalta. So that's what I'd be afraid of. Okay. Great. Thank you, Lisa, so much. Thank you.